It is such a pleasure to be here, and um, I was very delighted to be invited to speak and very intrigued uh, with the topic that uh, we decided on. And of course, no better timing than we're, when we're having changes in our healthcare market, uh, literally on the day of a Rotary speech. So um, someone uh, who is the program chair had uh, a, a, a lot of forethought and uh, obviously a crystal ball. But uh, there are a lot of changes going on in healthcare certainly not just in Baton Rouge, but all over the world. And uh, I, I do think it's kind of interesting to, to take a pause and think about that. Uh, Bill and I went to a uh, function uh, for the new president of LSU on uh, Saturday night, and I had a colleague who I'm looking around the room, I don't think he's here, although he's a member of Rotary. He said, what were you thinking accepting that invitation? You're not really gonna talk about that, are you? And I said, well, I was, why? He said, because you're not from out of town and you don't have a briefcase when you stand at that podium. And he said, you only are an expert when you are from 50 miles away with a briefcase. And that is true. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, as, as I was preparing my remarks today um, and I'm looking around the room, there's so many people who have been in Baton Rouge for many decades were either uh, born and reared here or came back here. And so I want to start, uh, as we think about the changing landscape, to think about where we came from. Uh, we were just talking about uh, my coming from New Orleans. And um, in New Orleans, I grew up with very, very dispersed healthcare systems. Um, I wouldn't even say there were systems. There were different hospitals. There was Baptist Hospital and Mercy Hospital and Hotel Du and Touro and so on and so forth. Um, and when I moved to Baton Rouge in the 70s, um, it, was a, it was a different healthcare market. It was very, very different. Um, and I think that, you know, if you, if you think about the major players, we, we had a lot of people who had uh, longstanding allegiances to one another. And so if you go back to the origins, uh, Franciscan missionaries of Our Lady, they actually uh, traced their roots back to France in 1854. Baton Rouge General was started in the year 1900. Uh, so we had our Catholic institution. Baton Rouge General was originally a Baptist institution. Um, not in Baton Rouge at that time, but in 1942, Oshner was started. And in 1968, Woman's Hospital was started by a group of doctors who uh, had been practicing in other places and decided that they wanted to leave and form their own uh, organization to serve specifically women and uh, provide for women's health care. <coughs> and then we also have something that's a little bit unique. If you go out in this market, we have um, some large groups of physicians who have come together and uh, stand for excellence either in their field of specialty or in, in multi-specialty as in Baton Rouge Clinic 1946. Um, I believe there were four doctors who started the Baton Rouge Clinic. That's a very unusual model to still be um, financially viable and in existence today. I just don't see that in a lot of other communities where we do consulting. Um, and I think that it, it is sort of a direct result of, of the market, where the market was, where it's come from, where it's going, uh, their ability to renew themselves, et cetera. But the same is true uh, of the Bone and Joint Clinic uh, and Neuromed a little bit later. Um, the, bless you. The, um, the founders of Neuromed uh, realized that they had a unique skill set and um, wanted to, you know, really be kind of in control of their own destiny. The interesting thing is that you really don't see a lot of those kinds of models today. Um, and uh, the same was true with the group that broke away from um, Women's Hospital, the Louisiana Women's Healthcare Associates. And here's what you may or may not know, but I was having a conversation with one of our partners, Rudy Gomez, who spends a lot of time consulting in healthcare. And I hadn't really thought about it this way. I know we have a lot of attorneys in here. Um, if you are part of a large law firm, uh, you get selected, you're in the law firm, you have certain policies about when to leave, you have certain exit strategies and agreed upon um, you know, ways of getting out and if you had equity or, or some partnership, how, you would, how that would become lucrative for you. It doesn't work that way in healthcare. So think about today, think about the amount of debt that a medical student has when they get out of medical school. It's astounding. It's absolutely astounding. They can't buy into a healthcare practice. 
they can't go to one of those uh, groups that's listed on there and pay to be part of that practice. They can't buy in. You also can't get bought out because the model doesn't sustain itself that way. So when it's time to leave, and of course we know a lot of baby boomers um, are getting ready to hang it up, and in healthcare, a lot of people had a hard year. They're, they're getting tired. They're saying, okay, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. And when they begin to exit, it's kind of like the social security system. Are there enough other people paying into it so that we can make this equation work? And so I think that that's why we don't see as many organizations like this in other parts of the com country because they were not able to convince younger people that that was a good place to practice, that they were going to be sustainable financially, and that they were going to really provide for their careers long term. I do think we have some great examples here, but the reality is that it is a low bar to entry and a low bar to exit, and you better make the money in the middle of your career because it ain't going to be there forever. So I think you know, it's going to be interesting to see changing landscape of healthcare, what happens with the remainders of the organizations that we have. And then in 2016, uh, some of you know, we formed the Baton Rouge Health District um, as a community. And uh, I almost just took a slide, even though I hate lots of slides, uh, with the logos that are on there, because it really is an amazing thing. And I think that's unique to Baton Rouge too, although I've done some research and there, there are similar things in other places. But you have the CEOs of Payers Blue Cross sits on there and is very active. You have the major uh, hospital CEOs, you have Mary Burr Perkins CEO, uh, and the Baton Rouge Area Foundation helps to convene them and, and uh, have good things happen. That's very unusual. I was privileged to work with them on some strategic planning right before the pandemic. Uh, and the, the vision that these dedicated people have for our community, it, it, it's, it's marvelous. Um, they talk about population health. They talk about dealing with chronic diseases. They talk about can we, can we lower health care costs for our employers? You know, wouldn't it be incredible if we set that as a goal and then we shared data and as a community we sort of took people and we really managed them and we helped them and we collaborated with that. I mean, that's a, that's a 10 or 20 year project. That's not for a little three year strategic plan, but it's a beautiful vision. And you wouldn't even be able to take some communities that I've worked in, especially in very competitive markets in Florida and Texas, and even get the CEOs in the same room, much less to collaborate and to talk about the needs of the community. So I think we're very blessed and we're very lucky uh, in ways that, that we don't even imagine. Now we still have a, a lot of challenges and we have a lot of change that's here and change that's coming. Um, I think there are really five drivers, in my opinion. You can go online and you can find the eight drivers, the 12, the three, the whatever. But these are the ones that I see uh, our clients really um, struggling with or having to deal with. And the first one is yet to really be, um, uh, we, we still don't know the impact of it. So some healthcare organizations did okay during COVID last year, the, the first wave. Some did not. Elective surgeries were canceled. They lost staff. They didn't have enough PPE. People didn't feel safe. It was a very challenging time. And for the organizations in Baton Rouge who were able to get PPE through the goodness of the community, get meals sent to their staff, help people keep going, uh, I, think, I think we were very blessed by all the people who stepped up to help. But we're not out of the woods, and in fact, we're going deeper in the woods, it seems like, than we did before and faster. So everybody here needs to get their masks out. You need to, uh, whether you got vac vaccinated or not, uh, you need to, to reconsider your decision if you didn't. But you need to be prepared because we are really, we are really hitting a wall here. Um, I'm part of a group that's um, working with the, the state the Office of Public Health in the Department of Health and the Department of Education uh, have received uh, a very large grant from the federal government, as the other states have, to do COVID testing in schools. Now, I thought that was a great project. That, that was nice. I'm happy to help do some outreach on it. Until day before yesterday, when my almost three-year-old granddaughter had to come home from her summer camp, which is a nice childcare experience, uh, because there, there was a child who tested positive, and later that day, another child who tested positive. 
no symptoms, totally asymptomatic, young children, cannot be vaccinated, younger than, than the current limit on that. Well, that threw my world into a spin. That threw my son and daughter-in-law's world into a spin. It threw the rest of the people who are in the office to have a three-year-old child in there. No, she's very good and quiet. But as employers, I think we really need to think about how can we do this differently? We've got to keep our schools open. People have got to go to work. People will lose their jobs. Some of us are very lucky that we have employers who allow us to bring children to work, bring dogs to work, to you know, work from home. We have the technology to do so. But the people who need their jobs the most do not. And so I'm gonna ask all of you in here, as citizens, as business owners, as people who employ other people, to please encourage people to get COVID testing in their schools and to help faculty and students be safe through the coming months because I think we're really, really gonna have a tough time. And again, the more stress we put back on our healthcare system, the more problems we're gonna have in the long run. Um, there are a lot of people who don't feel like they had a chance to really get a deep breath since the first round. And now we're going into the second round. The amazing thing is that there are such good people in the world. Tina, where are you, Tina Holland? I know you're in here somewhere. Oh, you're at the front table. Um, so uh, accelerated programs in the middle of COVID, to have respiratory therapists who have signed up, incoming respiratory therapists, and are taking an accelerated program so they can get bedside sooner. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Bill and I went to the World War II Museum a few weeks ago when things finally opened up for a little while, and, and it reminded me of that, that spirit of, I have to help, this is a problem. And I know there are people like that all over the country, there are people like that all over the world. I just think we are extremely blessed here in Baton Rouge because we have that. Um, we also have some um, political transitions. Um, there were some things that the Trump administration did that were helpful. There were other things that were not helpful. There are things that the Biden administration are doing, considering, et cetera. Things that were important to our state were Medicaid expansion. It was very important that we have more people who had health care coverage and, and good health care coverage, and I certainly hope that that will stay. Uh, we have telehealth during the pandemic, uh, which was covered by CMS, the major payer. Uh, Medicare uh, was paying for telehealth, still are. I hope that continues too, but that will change the landscape of visits because as you'll see in a moment, there are a lot of people who prefer looking at their phone and talking to their doctor than being there in person. Um, and so I think we're gonna see a lot of that. But in addition to um, the, the idea of, of um, payers and politics, we have some changes that are going on um, that many of you face every day. And so this chart, and obviously you can't read the numbers, but the, the visual is the point of the whole chart. Since 1999, annual worker and employer contributions have grown in those 20 years at the rate that you see. The dark blue uh, is actually the uh, employer's part of the contribution, and the lighter blue is the employee's part of the contribution. So we all feel that. I know when we do compensation studies, um, we, we have to figure out if there's a 28% load on, a, on an employee. Um, we have clients all the time who say, well, I really need to hire someone else, but maybe I can do it on contract. Maybe I can get a part-time worker because I just really can't afford the health care. That creates pressure um, in a different sort of way. It creates it at the ballot box, it creates in Washington, but it creates pressure locally. And I do think that, um, uh, and I was very pleased, uh, Michael, you can go back and tell Dr. Steve this, that the loudest voice at the table in the health district conversation was Blue Cross, who said, we've got to do something about this. It's too expensive. We've got to do it, and we want to help. So obviously, that's a long-term solution, as I said, but the reality is this is driving a tremendous amount of the change, and it's going to continue to drive change going forward. So healthcare has become a little bit more retail. Now think about healthcare for a minute. It's the only thing that you buy and pay for that you didn't really know what you were buying, right? Somebody else has got to buy it for you. The doctor's got to buy it for you. You want an MRI? Well, you can't just walk in a hospital and say, I'd like to have an MRI. Doctor has to order it, okay? So you have a third party ordering things. In some hospitals, that person is not even aligned with the hospital. They have credentials, 
but they may or may not be aligned with the hospital in other ways. In other places, those physicians are owned. Let me go back to that point for a minute. When I was talking about the good old days of healthcare, uh, when I married my husband, my father-in-law, Dr. Slaughter, terrible name for a surgeon, <laughs> Dr. Slaughter. <laughs> You can't make this up. <laughs> you have to be a really good surgeon if your name was Dr. Slaw. Um, two interesting points. The first one is that the market was so different and, and um, so collegial at the time that in the same year, he was chief of surgery at, at Our Lady of the Lake and chief of staff at the Baton Rouge General in the same year. And you saw that. And, you, and that was not an unusual sort of thing. Obviously, we agree to that, but the fact is we're going to have to figure out how we go back to some things like that because we have a community and we need community health care. And sometimes we're going to be competitors in some things and sometimes we need to be partners in others. And I do see that in some markets and, and where it happens, it's, it's wonderful and does very well. But if you remember, Oshner, I had the block uh, on there that it was started in 1942. So that is just right after my father-in-law graduated from medical school. And so we found a, a big, big um, envelope um, in some family papers during the pandemic. It's a good time to clean out things, right? So, so we found this big envelope that we'd never looked inside. And when we opened it up, it had a leatherette booklet from his Tulane Medical School graduation. And it had a picture of his class. There were about 12 or 15 men in the picture. And among those were Dr. Michael DeBakey, credited with the first heart transplant, right? And John Oshner. And then I remembered seeing a document, I don't know where it is, but it was notes that my father-in-law had written to his buddy John Oshner about what he liked about what he was getting ready to do and what he didn't like about what he was getting ready to do. And his fear that if you, if you employ physicians, where is the physician's loyalty? Is it to their patient? Is it to their employer? Now, don't take that literally, but just imagine how radical that was back in the day. Now we have our, our hospitals here employ 400, 600 physicians. We don't think anything of it. That's still a slightly different model. But the reality is that Things uh, in, in terms of healthcare have come away from the physician being the key to the consumer. And, and now we have come into a retail moment in time that is very, very interesting and it's something we're gonna have to navigate very carefully. The healthcare consumer is much more selective and much more cost conscious than they ever were. Um, I don't know those of you who are still employed and working if you have high deductible plans, but. Um, you know, a lot of our um, clients do. And it makes people very conscious of what they're going to sign up for when they actually schedule elective surgeries and things like that. Um, and, and they do want more transparency. They want to see what things cost. They want to shop around. They want to compare. Um, I, I knew the world had changed when um, Bill had some medical issue and I came home one day and he said, well, I found a doctor who's rated 4.8. And I said, what? Bill Slaughter, he knows how to go on the federal website and see what, how people are rated and what, you know, zoom around and that. Well, Curtis said he was good and I think he is too, so I'm going to go there. Um, that's rampant. We, we just got to get ready for that. Public and private insurance exchanges are making the consumer a more active participant. So, so we're being driven to be more active. And that, that's kind of good for everybody, I think, in the long run, although it's very different. Entrepreneurs, governments, payers, and health systems are bringing price transparency to the marketplace, some of them kicking and screaming the whole time. But um, I, I don't think there's much we can do about that. It's coming. And then con consumers uh, continue to be attracted to very convenient and cost-effective sites of care, retail clinics, uh, virtual care, et cetera. I do have to tell you this funny story. I was looking around to see if my brother-in-law was here. So I was doing some work with uh, the West Feliciana Community Hospital. Now, I just got to tell you, if you don't know, this is the best kept secret in Louisiana. They have their own emergency management system and they have their own helicopter to airlift you anywhere you need to go and that's paid for by the taxpayers and they have a lovely beautiful new facility 
um, where they can treat a whole lot of things that need to be treated, and then they can obviously take you either by uh, ambulance or, or by air to wherever you need to go to get whatever else you need. Well kept secret. But while I was there doing strategic planning, we were talking about changes in healthcare. And um, I had a list of competitors to test with the physician groups, the, the different focus groups, the department heads, et cetera. And on there was Walmart. And um, you know, CVS, Walmart, you know, where are you gonna get your health care in the future? And so I said, so are you worried about any of these? And I'll never forget one group in particular. They were, they were very smug about where they were and what, what they were able to do. And one of them said, we don't even have a Walmart in this parish. It's in Zachary. And we will never have a Walmart in this parish. I said, well, then we don't have anything to worry about. There's no competition for health care in West Louisiana. Uh, pick up your phone and see, you know, that where you can connect to, you know, Cleveland Clinic or whatever. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I do think that, you know, these are, these are such new concepts that we're just really not quite ready for it. But when I tell you that things are changing fast, so just as we have a whole lot of baby boomers and we're starting to exit and we're starting to do things differently, we got more millennials. And millennials have babies. And millennials have little children. And millennials are very interesting consumers of healthcare. So a lot of millennials, research shows, do not have a primary care physician. Why? They get health care. They believe urgent care is a primary care physician. These are smart kids. These are people, our consultants, people that I meet on the street, my son's friends, etc. You know, no need to have a primary care physician because urgent care is there. They're extremely cost conscious. I think that, you know, when you look at uh, the, the years that the older millennials have been in the workforce, um, they had some things that were pretty significant that really diminished their, their income and earning power, some research says, uh, for the rest of their lives. Now, the later millennials, uh, not quite as much, but I do think that you're going to see that push from that group uh, for transparency. They judge a hospital or a doctor by how quickly their website loads. True. True. What does TLGE mean? Too long gave up. I had one of our young consultants write me that one day. I was like, did she have a typo? Is that, what, what could that be, TGIF? I mean, nobody said that anymore. Uh, below a certain age, but too long gave up. So if it doesn't load fast enough, if they're waiting too long for something, it's extremely frustrating. So research actually shows millennials' attention span is 12 seconds. <coughs> the next group, Generation Z, their attention span is eight seconds. <laughs> so we gotta get those search engines going. We gotta get those websites going. But this is my favorite, and there's a whole body of research so millennials who are parents have been nicknamed perennials. And so perennials are, have been raised by helicopter parents, you know, those of us in the room who, you know, had these wonderful children that we, we, you know, were very vigilant over. Now they become that kind of parent, even worse. And so there's nothing that's too good for their children. And of course, the baby boomer grandparents help that out too. And so they will do anything to get their child the best health care that they can. Now that's an, that's an interesting fly in the face um, sort of factoid, but I do think that we're seeing that in a lot of areas. And um, I think that you know people who understand that, pediatric health care, we have a beautiful new children's hospital, we have um, Oshner that's um, you know, specializing in pediatrics in the Baton Rouge market. There are people who understand what that means. And I do think that raises the vote for everybody. I think that that's, that means better health care for all. I will tell you this one thing since I mentioned uh, about my granddaughter. Four years ago, before she was born, I was doing some work for the Academy of Sacred Heart in New Orleans, her sister Melanie. And um, I was with the pre-K, the, the baby teachers, and we were talking about customer expectations and how to meet them and that sort of thing. And they said, well, they really like um, our texts and videos. And I said, oh, do, do you do videos? I said, what kind of videos? Well, every day we text a picture of their child, and on Friday we text a video, and it has their child somewhere in the video. 
So we have to get all the children during the week somewhere in the video. I said, you gotta be kidding. Oh no, they said, we text when they have a BM. <laughs> and I thought, this is, I've never heard of this. Until my grandbaby went to school and my daughter-in-law gets that text and sometimes sends it to me. And I'm like, well, isn't that great? <laughs> Oh, what emoji to use when she sends me. I'm like, wow, good, okay, everything's great. I think this is I, I think this group is gonna really make some changes in healthcare and it's gonna be interesting for us to watch. Now the number one driver, and I I could have spent the whole time on this, the number one driver is uh, the move from volume to value. I was hoping Terry Fino was gonna be here today. You see that quote? She told me that in 2012. She was, she was at a conference in the American um, uh, Hospital Association, and they had a speaker that she eventually brought to Baton Rouge. And he said, an organization like Women's Hospital, just because he's in Women's Hospital, has got to have one foot on the dock and one foot in the motorboat. And what he was trying to say is that healthcare is going to change. In 2012, it was happening in other parts of the country. It had not yet come to Baton Rouge. We thought it was going to come a whole lot sooner, but it didn't. And you begin to get kind of um, a little bit complacent that maybe it's not ever going to come here. Maybe we're just going to be a different kind of place. But it did come, right? And it is here. And what he meant was, you got to keep a foot on the dock, stay on the dock. Don't spend the money. Don't spend the money on doctors. Don't buy everything you can possibly see. Don't, don't invest in technology and crazy things until you have to. But when you have to, you better jump in that boat really, really fast because it's going to speed away 70 miles an hour. And that's what we're seeing today. So this is hard to see, I know, but it's all over the internet. This is the slide Terry brought to us in 2012, those of us who were on the board, and showing us how we were going from this volume-based healthcare to a value-based healthcare. So we were going from fee-for-service, we were going from uh, everyone being independent, um, uh, you know, uh, acute inpatient hospital focus. It was all about keeping the hospital full. Um, I can remember going to the hospitals and walking in the door in the CEO suite and saying, how are things? And they would immediately tell me their census. That was the important thing. How many heads in beds? How many people do we have? And now all of a sudden it flipped. And then it was like, we don't want to be full. That's a bad thing, right? Because we're trying, to, we're trying to treat people outside of this very expensive environment called a hospital. And that's value-based healthcare. And in value-based healthcare, what you do is you align yourself. So let's just take physicians. You align yourself, you align your goals. And so you form uh, associations and uh, payer um, sorts of products where you're bundling them and you're incenting, uh, you know, a, a lack of utilization and you're incenting a, a lack of uh, watching uh, tremendous testing and costs go up. And most of the rest of uh, the country is there, is value-based and had been there for a while. And we have some, some dynamite examples of that here in Baton Rouge. Now that's a bit in the weeds for the average person. But that's why you're seeing some of the things that you're seeing right now in Baton Rouge, because we are going through that. And we were late to that party, in my opinion, and we have got to, get, we got to jump in that motorboat as a community very fast, because that's the way things are going. So I think um, a lot of people saw in some of the news stories about um, electronic medical records, the ethics system, legacy systems. But I've got to tell you what, it's not just about keeping people's data and information in an electronic format or a database. Because the leaders are now able to share that and use that with meaningful impact on people's health care. Where it's triggering something for the physician to say, this person needs to have this. It's connected to monitoring devices, or it will be connected to the Internet of Things and all these things that we wear that pick up heartbeats and, and uh, AFib and everything else. So I think that where we're going is in a sophisticated direction that some of us ha haven't even thought of and can't even imagine. Um, there's a focus on increasing engagement strategies, engaging the consumer, the healthcare consumer, online apps and telemedicine uh, being one, but um, using care management teams 
Because the reality is, if we're going to keep you out of the hospital, then you have to be compliant. You have to know what you're supposed to do when. And i got to tell you, that it gets harder and harder for me. You know, I go to the eye doctor. What, what did she say? What did she tell me to do? What do I do with these drops? Am I supposed to do them every day for a month? Every day for a week? I look for it. Where are my notes? What did I write down? So I think that, you know, when, when you look at this on a large scale, there's a tremendous opportunity there. Um, when you talk about population health and, and minimizing risk and, and going up to scale, uh, I think we're going to see much more emphasis on team structures, and I think they'll even cross healthcare lines. Uh, I think that they'll cross into schools. I think that they will cross into social service agencies. And so what we will have is uh, a new model where the consumer or the healthcare consumer, I really hate that word, healthcare consumer, but I don't like patient either, where that individual that we all want to take care of has a myriad of people who are all um, working together to try and make things better. And that will include care coordinators, pharmacists, nurse, nurse practitioners, etc. And when you begin to see things that way, you realize that uh, that's going to take a lot of changes. Um, so this is a quote uh, that uh, talks about what physician alignment really is. And just because you buy a physician practice or a lot of physicians does not necessarily mean that you have you have real alignment. And unfortunately, um, we see a lot of hospitals that have spent a lot of money buying a lot of docs who then get to satisfy, leave, rest on their laurels, um, you know, act as anchors uh, around the organization's neck. And so a lot of this has to do with going beyond this and looking at the culture of the organization. Um, I can't emphasize the importance of culture, and we've all heard this quote, culture is strategy for breakfast. Um, there are people in this room who will remain nameless who have worked at Our Lady of the Lake and the Batman Show, and those are different cultures. I work for the St. Joseph's Healthcare System in Orange, Texas, in Love, Texas. They have a very unique culture. I was told the first day that I was in Love, now, don't say these things in front of the sisters. What? Is that a joke? No, we don't talk about these things in front of the sisters. They don't want to know. They don't want to hear it. So we don't talk about it. I thought, how's that working for you? I mean, you know, we're not going to talk about cost. Really? Because that's money. And that's nasty stuff. Now, they got over that real fast. Okay, they're one of the largest systems uh, in the United States today. But the reality is, Culture has a lot to do with the success of the organization. There are tremendous talent wars. They're going on in your organization, they're going on in healthcare. But when we think about the competition, it's not who you think it is. So we got everybody going to Ascension Parish. Everybody's healthcare is going to Livingston. Cleveland Clinic is going to Abu Dhabi and London. Uh, they are, they, the last part of this statement, only one in 200 Americans receive care at Cleveland Clinic, but the last statement, it's our ethical obligation to serve as many patients as possible. Come into your neighborhood soon. So I think that, you know, when you start seeing all this emphasis on virtual reality and robotics and artificial intelligence, what you realize is that our world is going to continue to change. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's, it changes uncomfortable. We never really like it. But um, this is corporate America. When do you think your company will buy at least one healthcare service from Amazon or Google? And most of them said, pretty soon. Yeah, we're ready for that. So when you, when you live in the world of healthcare, none of this is a surprise. When you think about um, life from outside, I don't think we always realize this. I'm going to leave you this, with this one thought. Uh, Jared from the Mayor's um, Healthy Lives uh, organization presented at the Leadership Great Baton Rouge program last Friday. He has some marvelous slides, if you ever have a chance to see them. He has a slide that says your life expectancy changes over 15 years if you are on Park Boulevard at Perkins Road and you turn right or you turn left. I leave you with that thought because that's our community and I thank you for all that you all do. Thank you very much. Thank you.